Okay, good morning, everybody. It's Peter here from AJS. And once again, we're venturing into a Jewelers What workshop somewhere in Australia. And this week, the pleasure we have of going to sunny Adelaide and meeting up again with Catherine Grocott. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much, Peter. I'd like to, uh, first of all, acknowledge that I am living and working and today demonstrating on the land of the Ghana people. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. Great to have you back again uh, in a slightly emptier room than normal. So we do have a little bit of echo, but I'm sure we'll cope with that. And yeah. uh, <laughs> today we're continuing our adventure in riveting rivets and we're on to space rivets. Uh, Catherine, do you want to explain what a space rivet is? Yes, we'll do. Uh, I've brought a, couple on, brought a couple of examples along to give you a, a bit of an idea. So this is one of the um, very first examples that I ever made using a space rivet. Um, the, in this piece, you've got uh, a piece of sterling silver on the top, a piece of acrylic on the back, but then you've got the space rivets in between. So these tiny little tubes of metal ensure that there's a gap between the two layers. So in this case, it serves a functional purpose because this is where the, um, the, like the necklace component of it hangs and it can't escape. So it can have some movement on that wire, uh, but when it hangs on the body, it just hangs nice and, nice and flat. Uh, on this example, on this ring, you've actually got lots and lots of space rivets in between uh, these discs of anodized aluminium. So the space rivets actually act as a way of uh, spacing them, but giving them a place where they can move and twist around uh, some wire that goes through the middle of it. Uh, so in this particular case, the, the wire was actually soldered onto the ring at the base. Then all of the pieces were put on. So a, a tube, a disc, a tube, a disc, a tube, a disc. And then it was riveted underneath this bezel setting. And then the dome was put on the top and set uh, like a cabochon stone. Uh, but again, so this is another way of um, utilizing rivets, uh, space rivets, uh, so that they've got uh, a little bit of space and this allows for movement of pieces. So and is that different. a ring there, Catherine? That's a ring, yep. Gee, that's so, practical, isn't it? Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> this, is, this is a definitely do not wear this while you're taking out the garbage bins. <laughs> Something bad will happen. <laughs> Very jazzy. So, yes. So what we're going to be doing today um, is basically the example of what uh, I've just shown you there of a nice classic uh, space rivet. So if you guys all remember, if you've all been visiting with me for the last three episodes of this, uh, in the first um, lesson, now let's make sure I'm in camera, yes. Uh, so this is uh, cutting the example in half. So kind of slicing through the middle of the rivet. You would have your two pieces of material, top and bottom. And you've got a piece of wire inserted into the middle. And you can either have the classic mushroom shape that goes over like that, or a square rivet that gets hammered out flat like this. The benefit of this one is, of course, that it doesn't get caught on things. It, it can't catch. It's nice and smooth when you run your finger over it. it um, you don't feel anything other than a nice smooth little bump. With this one, it's much more obvious and raised. Uh, so the second one we did was the flush or countersunk rivet. So this one, you had your two pieces of metal or leather or acrylic or whatever material you're using, but you used a little ball burr just to take out that, uh, the top and bottom of that particular material. And then when you hammered, 
you filled that space up with the wire. And then when you filed it flat, if it was in the same material as what you used uh, here, so if it, say for example, you used using sterling silver here and this was sterling silver, if you filed it flat, you would not be able to see it. It should be invisible. If it was an alternative material, then you'd have just this perfectly circular little dot. Um, and then our third one was tube rivets. So this is where you have your pieces of material, top and bottom. But instead of putting a piece of wire through, you are putting through a tube. So this is the tube kind of cut in half. So you're looking at the inside, like, yeah, the two walls of the tube. And then you can rivet it over so that you've got a hole all the way through the middle. So for today, we're doing something a little bit different as with those examples I showed you, we're actually going to be creating space in between the two pieces of material. So we've got a piece of material here, top and bottom. Oh, I'm not quite in camera there. But our tube is actually going to be in this part here. So this is the tube walls and the diameter of the tube, the inside diameter needs to be exactly the same as the drill bit that goes through. So that when you put your wire through, it's got a nice firm secure fit. Uh, so then I put my wire through And once again, I can have my little classic mushroom up the top or my square, yeah, square rivet. Let me see if I can just hold it up a bit so you can see. There we go. Excellent diagrams, Catherine. Oh, good. I hope everybody understands <laughs> when, I, when I cut things in half. No, well explained. <laughs> Excellent. Um, now, this is what I'm going to be demonstrating today. But if you wanted to, and you haven't already seen them or you want a refreshment, go back to episode two and episode three, and you can do the countersunk rivet or the tube rivet for this, um, for this same method. So for with, with your, uh, yeah, your countersunk, you would still be creating the countersunk area in your top two, top and bottom pieces. Your tube still goes in between. You'd still put your wire in, same, in the same way. And then you're still hammering to fill that space and then filing it off so that it becomes yeah, nice and yeah, either invisible or just a little round dot. And finally, you can do a tube inside a tube. Uh, so you can, you can do a tube space rivet. Uh, so you've got your two pieces of material. You've got your tube in here and then this is where you do need to get some accurate um, uh, measurements of tubing so for this the inside diameter of your space tube has to be the same as the outside diameter of your inner tube so it's going to be looking like this now. And then that gets riveted over the top. 
So the same methodology as that you would use for you know, these uh, rivets get used for this, except you are putting a spacer in between. So shall we have a look at some tools that you'll need? Yes, indeed. Now, Catherine, just uh, while you're getting those tools, I'll just uh, say good morning to Diane and Gail and oh. to any others who are out there watching. If you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, that'd be great. And uh, let's have a look at the tools we're going to be using today. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> oh, there's so, others there, but they, they've in particularly introduced themselves. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> so a few things we'll need. Uh, you will need a couple of blocks. So one is a drilling block and one is a steel block. You will need um, a riveting hammer of some kind, so either a small ball peen hammer or a cross peen hammer, depending on uh, which way you prefer to rivet. Me personally, I'm a ball peen riveter. <laughs> um, you need some material, of course. So I'm using some aluminium. Uh, aluminium can't be soldered uh, easily in a jewellery um, setting. So I've got some yeah, scrap aluminium. I've got, and I'm using some alternative colours, so hopefully it'll show a bit better on the video. I've got some uh, tube or chenille, uh, as many jewellers will not buy, chenille, uh, and some wire. So this wire, the outside diameter, is the same as the internal diameter, the inside diameter. So it just kind of slides in nice and firmly. You don't want, again, you don't want too much movement there uh, at all. You want a nice firm fit. We need a pair of parallel pliers. Uh, these come in handy for when you're trying to insert wire. A tube or a chenille cutter. Uh, this is one thing I would invest in a good quality version. Uh, it, yes, put your money into a good quality version of that. We need flush cutters, a saw, emery stick, and possibly a file, depending on what you're um, drilling through. A little bit of masking tape to protect work if you need that. And your drill bit on your... Um, Micromotor. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, we've had a disaster. Sorry, folks. <laughs> That's this right. We're is using. Due to having a phone that has been lent to me because mine has been under repairs five times under warranty. Um, and. Yes, it doesn't quite set up the same as what my other one did. So I apologise for that. At least it's still in one piece, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's hope that doesn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's start. So I've got my drilling block here. Uh, and when you are... When you're... Actually, I might draw this. When you're drilling with um, – if, if you had something that had multiple drill holes required, so, for example, um, in that piece where I've got the four, uh, the four rivets in each corner, it is much, much more difficult – to drill through things that are spaced. So um, this is one of the few times where you may have to drill the holes before you rivet everything. So with the other um, variations, you would drill one, you would rivet it, you would then drill the opposite one, rivet that one, and then come back in and do the, the others. In this case, you may not be able to do that because, of course, when something's spaced apart, uh, trying to drill through a gap, you can go all, um, you can get your drill bit at a, a bad angle. Uh, it can catch because it's got so much space. Um, so you do have to think through how you're going to do um, 
yeah, the, the drilling of this. So what I've tended to do is if it's material that can do this um, or can handle super glue, I use super glue to, to glue the two pieces together, get them exactly in the right position, and then I'll drill all the holes in one go. You do need to be a lot, lot more precise with your drilling at this point, because again, if you have your angles, um, your drill angle uh, kind of not perpendicular to the material, it means that when you put the space rivet in, it's going to have to be at an angle. Uh, so this needs a bit more precision uh, with the drilling. So again, um, if you don't have multiple holes though, if you only have one, like on that ring, um, that's not required. Uh, so you do need to think about how you're going to um, yeah, work out the, the drilling and which process you're going to use. So because for this demonstration, I'm just doing one, I will be drilling through my two pieces of material separately. So I've got a, a drill bit here that is the same diameter as the wire that I'm going to be using. Uh, so this has got a one mil, one mil drill bit, one mil wire, and then the internal diameter of my chenier is one mil. And I think the outside diameter might be about two, yeah, two mil. So you can uh, drill your holes in your material. What you can use if you want to be uh, a little bit more precise is a center punch. So you can yeah, center punch your hole, get it where you want. And I'm trying to be very careful that I don't hit my camera and send it flying. Yeah, good idea. Want that. Yeah. <laughs> So oh, now that, mm, if I bring that right over here, you can still see, and I'm not hitting the camera. Oh. <laughs> yeah, make sure you have your micromotor on. Okay. So drilling through. And because it's aluminium and a nice sharp drill bit, nice clean cut quite quickly. If, of course, you, you know, drilling through some harder material, um, using some, yeah, lubricant, uh, you know, like burr life or something like that, uh, would definitely be beneficial. So I've got my two pieces of aluminium drilled. Uh, I would recommend just kind of cleaning up any burrs that might occur from the drill. Uh, and getting rid of that so that uh, you've got a nice flat surface for, for the wire to go through. Okay. Now, sometimes with softer materials like aluminium, it can actually, um, like the burrs can actually go back into the hole. So sometimes I find that just giving it another quick little drill through might be just all it needs just to get rid of that last little bit. So I'll get that out of the road. The next thing to do is to cut your chenille. Uh, so you need to have that the spacer in between. So this is where your chenille cutter will come in handy. So this has a little, a little lever. There's a dial at the back that then allows your stopper to move in and out. And on this particular one, it actually has measurements. Um, you might be able to see like measurements down here so that you can determine exactly the length of any uh, spaces or tubes that you want to cut. Um, the benefit of having um, yeah, something like this with that, um, the screw at the back means that you can cut multiple chenilles all the same length. Uh, so if, again, if you're doing something like that necklace where you have four, you can make sure that all four are exactly the same. So one of the first things to do is to uh, make sure that your ends are actually nice and square. So I'm gonna give this a little, 
bit of a clean up. And certainly being able to clean up chenille when you're, you've got your long piece there, you've got something to hold on to. So what I tend to do is I will clean up both ends and make them square, then cut from both ends. So I cut off two in one go, come back, square off the ends, um, cut another two, square off the ends, cut another two. Um, and that just means it's a little bit more efficient than just doing one, one at a time. So I've inserted the, the wire into, sorry, the tube into the chenille cutter. And this is where I, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this because of the camera. Uh, you want me to use the other camera? Yeah, Matt, can that one, can you see it from that one? Yeah, that's, that might be better. So just, um, just inside where the stopper is, there is a tiny little groove uh, and you insert your saw frame blade into that groove. The little latch holds the, the tube in place and then you can cut through. Again, you can put some lubricant on the back of your saw blade to make this a bit easier. The other thing to think about, <laughs> there is a bit of a, um, when you are sawing through tubing, of course, you're sawing through a space that the hole in the middle um, can mean that you end up with um, like a catching. The smaller the diameter of uh, tubing, the less likely that is to happen. But the larger tubing, um, yeah, it's more likely to happen. So I'm just going to tip that out. Come on, little tube. There we go. And then you've got your tiny little piece of chenille tubing ready to go. Now, you can... Um, you can sand off the other end so it's nice and clean and flush and hasn't got any um, kind of scratch marks through it. So a couple of ways of being able to hold on to that tiny little piece of chenille. You can use a, a skewer. You just pop the chenille onto the end of it, hold it in place with your finger and then file off the other end. Um, the more expensive version <laughs> is to use uh, kind of parallel pliers that have, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it's got like a little groove on one side. And so you can put the chenille into that groove, hold it in place, and then file the end flat. So... The next step is then to get everything aligned. And you do need your... Oh! Gee, me. I wasn't even anywhere near it. Oh, uh -oh. I'm sorry, everybody. I know this is not the... Uh... Well, at least the vision was coming through the other camera, so we didn't all crash to the ground then, but we oh, saw no. it happen. <laughs> oh. You'll be able to watch the action replay later. <laughs> Just, oh, I'm so sorry, people. This is not... Uh, well, you can show it to the insurance company as well, Catherine. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got... Oh, this is so awkwardly balanced. Um, yeah. So we've got our two pieces of material uh, and we're now going to um, yeah, get everything threaded up. So I'm going to use my parallel pliers here. And this is, um, again, this is a way of being able to hold your wire securely uh, and not bend it. Because, of course, when you're using, you know, 0.8 or 1 mil wire, it can bend very, very easily. So if you have it uh, inserted into parallel pliers, it holds it all the way down the wire and keeps it straight. So... 
insert into one. Then pop your spacer on, nice and firm. And then insert your, uh, the second piece. So we should have something that looks like this. So we've got the metal, the spacer, the metal, and then um, the wire all through all three. And out comes your secret weapon. I think I've shown you guys this every time. Your two pieces of playing cards. So for this, I've got a playing card that's been cut in half, folded in half, and then little holes just punched through it with a small hole punch. So I use these and I insert them on both ends. And this is my way of being able to measure how far I need to cut. So I've got my, almost my, like a sandwich. <laughs> uh, so I've got playing card, metal, spacer, metal, playing card. Uh, all ready to go. So then I grab my block, something nice and flat, and I'm going to squash that down so that I've got the minimum amount of um, Yeah, there's no movement. There's uh, the minimum amount of wire is going to be poking out. Now, before I do that, before I start cutting though, I need to make sure that I've actually filed that end flat. Um, again, if you're going to be doing multiple rivets, file both ends of the wire flat um, and then you can do insert them. Um, you're only doing that process once in one go. So I might grab a little smile. And I'm just going to file that off flat. Having it flat uh, just means, oh, thanks. Let's see, what, can you see? Yes, see me there. I'm just going to file that off. And here's the blind lady, you know, <laughs> over the top of her. So when you file a, a piece of wire flat, it should look like a little circle at the end. If it looks like an oval, you know that you've filed it at an angle. So as long as it's a nice circle, uh, you know you've filed square. Okay, so now, now that I've got that nice filed end, I push down, make sure that that's the least amount of wire in the system and my other, Secret weapon, my flush cutters. So the flush cutters have a flat back on, um, yeah, a flat side and then a dented side. So you want the flat side to be pushing down against your sandwich and cutting. Uh, and this means that you then do not have to file that side flat. If you did not have a pair of flush cutters and you just had a normal pair of pliers um, yeah, or cutters, then you could leave your um, piece of uh, cardboard in place, your, your playing card, and use that as your protection to just give it a little file to ensure that it's flat before you rivet. So then you can take off your pieces of Paper. Catherine, we've just got a, a question from Veronica who's just joined us and she said um, that she's wondering, is this also known as a sandwich setting? <laughs> I like that. that yeah. Um, that... I, I, I'm not sure that that's, that was a joke. So uh, probably not <laughs> then, Veronica. Yeah. I've yeah, never said so that. But we're I, talking I, about space rivets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so space rivets, Veronica. I've got my little piece of, yeah, I've got my pieces there ready to go. And 
I'm now getting up to the riveting stage. So yeah, if you've seen the very first video, this is the same as, uh, yeah, as that. So I'm going to be using a ball peen hammer uh, and I use that rounded edge to create that mushroom shape and the flat side I would use to create that square rivet. Uh, so if I want to protect this work, so if it was something like anodized aluminium or um, uh, it had been powder coated or something like that, then I might use a little bit of uh, masking tape to be able to just protect the work. So I'll do one side protected so that you can see what I do. So I've got just little, little bits that I put around. Yeah, around the wire. And of course, you will notice, uh, well, actually, I, I don't know whether you can see in the video, but because it's spaced, of course, you're going to have the, the piece kind of moving from side to side until you kind of rivet it down and secure it. Um, so just be prepared for a little bit of movement of your material, uh, especially on the first rivet. Um, once you get one in, it'll become a little bit more secure. And then certainly as soon as you get two or more in, um, you won't have a problem. So you do want just a little frame around that rivet so that the, um, the metal has a place to go. Okay, so then we start doing the hammering. So what you're trying to do is create for the mushroom rivet a nice, oval, like a nice dome shape. Uh, so you're trying to spread the metal from the inside to the out. Uh, so you're just going around and around that little piece of wire just to start it spreading. But with riveting, if you just riveted one and got it all completely fine, you would have no metal on the other side. So you have to flip over and make sure that the other side gets riveted as well. So again, you push it as far down as possible so that that piece of wire uh, pokes up and you do this side. Then you go to back to the other side. And so for some of you, you would have heard me say that sometimes I count uh, you know, maybe 20 or 30 hits on one side, 20 or 30 hits on the other. And so that should help to um, mean that you've got a nice, even, like the same size rivet on either side because you're hitting the same amount of metal. and continue. So this is a case of backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, until get it nice and nice and dome shaped. So is patience the key? Catherine? Oh yes, yes. So you can see already now I can't move those two pieces. They are nice and secure in place. Um, if I peel that protective layer off, I should be able to kind of run my finger over it and it just registers that little bump, but nothing's caught. So if I go in different directions, I should be able to feel that if it's correctly done, I won't have anything catching. If I can feel a little bit, then I might go back in. I can put my protectors back on, give it another little, up, you know, where it was sitting up. Yeah, attack it again clean it up, make sure that, that that little lip is now flush. Yeah. Turn over, make sure that the other side is, is good as well. 
but yeah, that, those two now are not moving. So that's nice and tight and secure. If you wanted it like my pieces that are spinning, then you want the rivet to just have a little bit of movement. Uh, if it's too tight, then of course the pieces won't move. That's, that's part of what riveting can do. Um, but if you do want things to move or spin, then you've got to kind of stop just before it secures everything in place. So there you have it. You've got one spaced rivet uh, that, yeah, kind of creates a little bit of, um, you know, air or space in between two elements of your design. So that's, that's the classic, like, mushroom-shaped rivet with a tubed spacer. <laughs> oh, well done, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll just take this opportunity to ask people if they do have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, let Catherine know and we can uh, share those answers with you right now. And uh, we'll just wait to see if anyone has any comments. So how often do you use that particular method then, Catherine? I actually really love riveting. Um, so I, I do use it quite a bit. Um, uh, In I particular, have, space rivets. Oh, space rivets, um, probably not as much as I've used the other types of rivets. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have a design of a, um, uh, a rivet ring that has... Uh, either, you know, the round version has five spaced rivets. Oh, no, 10 actually, 10, because there's three layers of metal. Um, 10 spaced rivets and the rectangular version has 12. Um, and it's actually the spaced rivets that hold a gemstone in place. Um, so it's, it's the riveting that is the almost the stone setting. Um, but I've also had... Um, yeah, pendants that have gone to an exhibition in in Russia, uh, where yeah, the riveting was the mechanism that kept the um, like the pendant part of it in place. So you had three layers of powder coated um, metal, and the middle layer had a like a hidden catch in it. And so then you would put your, um, like I handmade some cord for it. The cord would catch, like hook onto that little catch and then you'd rivet the three layers in place. And so that catch was then completely invisible. You, you couldn't see, yeah, how it worked. Um, but that one was a, that was just a normal classic, classic rivet. Um, and then they became very obvious against they were sterling silver and the metal being powder coated uh, was all brightly coloured. Uh, so you just had these nice little pops of colour. <laughs> mm. So what was the circumstance that it went to Russia? Oh, it was uh, like very, very, um, it, it was a, yeah, an incredible privilege and opportunity um, where it was the first contemporary jewellery exhibition that Russia has ever held. Uh, so Russia tends to have had a, a jewellery history of mostly the kind of very traditional, you know, gold, diamonds, um, uh, like Russian, Russian wedding bands in, you know, three types of gold. Uh, and so there was a group of contemporary jewellers there that were trying to kind of um, push, yeah, push the boundaries, push the ideas of jewellery. Uh, and they sent out a worldwide um, uh, call for designs and specifically to do with um, women's issues. Uh, and, yeah, my pieces uh, were talking about um, some of the, uh, the, the statistics and... Um, some of the issues that Indigenous women face in comparison to women, to the rest of the female population in Australia. So kind of 
more likely to experience domestic violence or uh, lower employment rates, um, things like that. So uh, yes, I'm very, very fortunate that that was chosen for the exhibition. Um, and then it, it started off in a, uh, a gallery in Moscow um, and then went to a couple of, there was two other places in Russia um, during its time there. So yeah, the girls who organized it, just amazing and promoting that jewelry does not just have to be gold and diamonds. The fact that mine were anodized aluminium, um, a little bit of sterling silver and handmade silk cord. Yeah. No, that was a great honor. Well done, Catherine. Oh, it was, yeah, it was really was a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we've got a request from somebody who would like to see the ring on a finger. Would you be able like to oh, demonstrate yeah. that? Yes. Certainly. Now, this person seems to have something in common with you. I think it's your surname. <laughs> the first name wouldn't happen to be Diane, would it? <laughs> uh, it correct. <laughs> that, that, would, that would be my mum. <laughs> Hi, mum. <laughs> oh, lovely. I'll just... Uh... Here we go. Okay, this is on the finger. And, yeah, you can spin these around and they can move. Um, yeah, so you can kind of set it up so that it looks almost like petals of a flower um, or you could, you know, spin it all around to one side and have it completely layered on top of each other. But It'd yeah. certainly be a talking point, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do get uh, a lot of comments when I wear this. Uh, and can you just show the uh, side profile? Just so, yeah. Um, yeah. So it does sit up off the hand, maybe about 15 mil. Um, so, yeah, you, you do need to be aware that it is on your hand and has the potential to, yeah, get caught. But I think for many people who are contemporary jewellers, so often they're very used to used to being aware of where their hands are so that when they wear their big pieces, they're not uh, damaging them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, that's great. Yeah. Well done. The sky's the limit <laughs> for what you that's can right. do. With contemporary jewellery, you really, there, there is just so much um, options and opportunity um, for amazing designs. Um, yeah, it, it is very exciting being in this, this world. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Well, I hope you've inspired people to go on today and uh, try their own space rivets. And uh, please feel free to uh, access the resources that Catherine's already created with the other versions of rivets as well. And Catherine, uh, we'll uh, wish you all the best and we'll look forward to catching up with you again in the new year. So that sounds thank, amazing. Thank <laughs> you so much. And thank you to all our people who were online there, including uh, Fliss, Liz, Amber, Veronica, Diane, Gail. And we'll look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon. Thank you very much. See Thanks you, Catherine. Thanks everyone for joining us. And yeah, I hope you get an opportunity to practice and have a play with rivets because they're lots of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.